tonight on Primetime Politics, sexual misconduct and the Canadian military. This time, it is different. The defence minister releases a roadmap for reform, but will it stop sexual harassment from happening and will the cultural change come quickly? We will speak to a panel of MPs. Also, I am taking full responsibility for my actions. The Federal Ethics Commissioner says Mary Ng broke conflict of interest rules. We'll hear how the Trade Minister responded today. And... We did it! A former Liberal Finance Minister from Ontario wins the Mississauga Lakeshore by-election. Does Charles Sousa expect to sit in Cabinet? Feeling great, guys. This is Primetime Politics. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Sarabio. The Defence Minister says it will be all hands on deck, promising to implement all recommendations made by retired Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour. Those 48 recommendations are aimed at changing the culture within the Canadian Armed Forces, a culture that experts say created a crisis of sexual misconduct. Here now is the Defence Minister, Anita Anand. It's not just morally right. It's operationally necessary. As you know, the Canadian Armed Forces is in a recruitment challenge. And we need to hold the confidence of the Canadian public to say this is an institution that is undergoing cultural change and this cultural change will continue to occur. It will take time and we will see it through. And finally, I will say that as minister, we never know how long we are going to hold our positions. But my goal is to put in place the institutional reforms necessary so that cultural change can last our what lifetimes. Is, what, what, what is it about? Well, with their reaction to the minister's report, we're now joined by three MPs. Brian May is the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Defence. Shelby Cramp Newman is an Ontario Conservative MP who sits on the Common Standing Committee on National Defence. And Lindsay Matheson is the NDP's Deputy House Leader. Hello to the three of you. Hello, good evening. Hello. Uh, Mr. May, I'm going to begin with you because I, I want to begin here with some broad strokes. The Minister says that substantive change is well underway. Uh, I'm wondering in what areas in particular. Now, the minister talked about uh, civilian prosecutions and military colleges as, uh, as examples, but where else has change already been made or at least on the way to being made? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank Madame Arbour uh, and her team and the dozens, if not hundreds, of stakeholders that uh, helped us get to where we are here today uh, with the tabling of this response to uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the Justice's report. Um, in terms of uh, your direct question, in terms of what else we are working on, there's actually 17 recommendations uh, of the 48 that we accepted and are moving forward on uh, since May and uh, since the, the, the report was tabled. So I'd, I'm afraid I would take up the majority of your time here today if I went through all of them, but I think there's some, some key just do it uh, within this report uh, that have, uh, we have moved the needle on already. You've already talked about uh, uh, moving uh, the, the, the uh, cases of misconduct, sexual misconduct out of the uh, uh, military courts into the civilian courts and that interim recommendation has, has been in place actually even before uh, the uh, uh, the justice's report. In fact, it's been in place since November of last year. Uh, Ms. Cramp Newman, what's your assessment of where the progress has or, or has not been made so far? Um, thank you for that. We have to acknowledge that there has been a lot of work done, and we certainly welcome um, the comments from uh, Minister Anand and her team. Uh, that being said, we have had seven years of inaction from this government. There's been it's almost like it's been a review of a review um, that was originally made back in uh, 2014. So I certainly acknowledge the work that's been done. Our military heroes, the people that have been through a tremendous amount of pain, need action on this. And words are great, but action is significantly more meaningful. So I'm really anxious to see where we're able to go with this. Um, is it going to take three months, six months? Um, we understood this morning that could take upwards of a decade before we actually see the full recommendations go into place. So we'll just uh, we'll play it by ear. 
Now, we did hear the defense minister saying this is going to take time. So, Ms. Matheson, uh, what do you say? What do you think of the progress made so far? Well, I certainly um, am happy to see the incredible work that was done by Justice Arbour. Uh, she uh, was very, very clear with us today in committee. But I know that a lot of service men and women are very skeptical, skeptical, and they have every right to be. Uh, they've seen this time and time again. They saw it with the Deschamps report, the Auditor General, the Justice Fish report, um, and now again. And it's really clear, uh, even one of the recommendations, number five, uh, spoke specifically about that moving of um, uh, sexual assault cases from the military court to the, to the um, civilian court. But that needs, to be, that needs to be backed up with legislation. And Justice Arbour is very, very clear about that. And when I asked the minister specifically about it, she didn't bring it forward. And, and those are the things that ultimately the opposition now, and is our job, to follow up and ensure that they're meeting the timelines because we cannot let go. We cannot give up. Men and women who have served, who have given their entire lives to serve their country, are depending upon us. I'm going to get to the timelines in a little bit, but Mr. May, we're going to bring you back into the conversation here because you, you, you thank Justice Arbour, but we, we saw her today appear before a parliamentary committee and, and uh, in front of the committee, as I'm sure you know, she accused military leaders of dragging their feet when it comes to sexual misconduct. Uh, how do you react to that, given that the minister is working on the, this portfolio, working along with military leadership to effect change? What do you make of the accusation that there's feet dragging here? Now, listen, I, I understand and I, I, I agree with my colleagues that uh, we're, we're talking about decades of inaction on this, on this particular issue. We need to get this right. And, and what is different about uh, the here and now is we have never seen uh, a response uh, to uh, these kinds of reports like we saw today. The report that the minister has tabled is not just simply a, a acknowledgement of the report. It's not simply just a recognition of the work done. It is actually a roadmap for each individual uh, recommendation uh, in terms of how we're going to move forward. That is entirely different than what we've seen in the past. And I, I completely appreciate and understand that there are people out there, including uh, uh, Madame Arbour, uh, that need to see action. They need to see, we need to work on, and develop that trust that, that we are moving forward. Uh, we do need to do so, though, in a very deliberate way uh, and make sure that we have those stakeholder, stakeholders along with us as part of that process. Process. So, Mr. May, you're saying uh, you, you, you need to have the stakeholders involved. Uh, Ms. Cramp Newman, you say you, you don't want this to take forever. Uh, Ms. Cramp Newman, what is uh, a reasonable timeline? What are you looking at here to, to, to say that there is progress being made that is satisfactory? Well, the timeline is, is it's, it's a pivotal time in the life of the Canadian military. Right now, a third of a military is dissatisfied with their role. 34% of the culture of the people are not happy with the culture within the military. So it's imperative and a profound movement that we need to act on now. So there's, there's, there's no delay here. We need to see action on this. In fact, we could do this immediately. We could, for example, with regards to moving to the civilian court, this is something that can happen overnight. Is it political will that's holding it back? Is it the um, defense minister, the justice minister? We need action on this, and there's no reason for delay. And um, Justice Arbor acknowledged that today. She was criticizing the government that it doesn't need to take months and years. This is something that can be acted on immediately. Mm -hmm. Ms. Matheson, uh, what would you add to that? And also, what type of update do you actually need? You talk about being able to follow this in a meaningful way. Uh, what do you make of moving the, uh, faster with the civilian prosecutions? What do you make of updates? There are certainly a lot of things that the government can do quickly. Uh, legislation is one of them. It was one of the simple, actually, pieces that I, we were asking for uh, and that our board was asking for. She uh, specifically also pointed to the external monitor, and I appreciate that that uh, person has been put into place, uh, and we're looking forward to, to hearing from Jocelyn Thierrien. She has about six months uh, to report in terms of uh, the Arbor report, and uh, and... I think that that's reasonable as a first response in terms of saying this is what needs to happen. But I will say again that a lot of Arbor's report re-emphasized the Deschamps report. And again, that's seven years old. So uh, time is of the essence. People need that response. They need to see that action. This government has 
has often provided great words, but no action. And so that's our job as, as the opposition to ensure that, that people get that satisfactory answer that they, they deserve. And certainly Canadians, both civilian and those within the military, are watching this very closely. Uh, to the three of you, thank you very much for the time. I'm sure we'll speak again. Brian May, Shelby Cramp Newman, and Lindsay Matheson, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. To the Trade Minister, Mary Ng now, who is today apologizing after the Ethics Commissioner concluded she broke conflict of interest rules. Now, this was back in 2020. Ng's office awarded a $17,000 contract to a friend she has known for decades. And while the amount was not huge, the Commissioner, Mario Dion, says there is no excuse for contracting with a friend's company. Here is how Mary Ng responded today in the House. Mr. Speaker, I have taken and I am taking full responsibility for my actions. I should have recused myself and I'm sincerely sorry for not having done so. What I want Canadians to know is that this will not happen again. Now, the contract was to, quote, quickly obtain media training for Minister Ng so that she could respond to COVID-19. Commissioner Dion says she should have recused herself from the decision. Now, the Prime Minister was asked about Mary Ng today, but rather than commenting on the ethics violation, this is what Justin Trudeau chose to talk about. Yesterday, the residents of Mississauga Lakeshore had a choice. They could choose between the Conservative Party's politics of division and reckless proposals that included recommending you opt out of inflation by investing in crypto, or our government's approach of being there for Canadians every step of the way and putting more money back in their pockets. Well, Mr. Speaker, the people of Mississauga Lakeshore have spoken and elected a Liberal Member of Parliament to come to Ottawa. The Prime Minister focusing on the by-election in Mississauga Lakeshore yesterday. Now that was a vote that was won resoundingly by Charles Sousa. He is a former Liberal Finance Minister for Ontario and is now a high-profile addition to the Prime Minister's team. Well, we're now joined by the new Member of Parliament for the Ontario riding of Mississauga Lakeshore, Charles Sousa. Mr. Sousa, congratulations. Good to see you again. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you and to uh, discuss the win and and I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Now there was some speculation that this by-election would have been a bit more of a nail-biter. Uh, the first since Pierre Polyev was elected uh, the Conservative leader. How do you think his leadership factored in, if at all, into the results yesterday? You know, it's a great question. I mean, I ran on a very positive campaign. We wanted to be there to respond and listen to the issues and the concerns that people had. And I found that the opponent, uh, in this case, it was mainly Pierre Perliev, all they ran on was the fact that Charles Souza was running uh, and Justin Trudeau was the prime minister and nothing more about what it is that they were planning to do. Um, and I think it resonated with the people, at least those that I spoke to, saying they don't want gimmicks or reckless policies or division or fear they really want people to provide some solutions and to provide real supports to uh, real problems well let's pick up on that point and, and also acknowledge the fact of course the analysis is coming here from uh, the liberal member who was elected last night but you know uh, pierre polyev has been very consistent in his messaging uh, that life has become unaffordable and while the federal government it, it does tout its programs like the GST rebates, the rental support, dental programs. Uh, Mr. Polyev points out that those programs are targeted. They don't really help out many people in the middle class. Are those concerns uh, not of concern to you? Are those concerns not echoed when you're out there campaigning? The, um, the community that I live in is very much middle class. Uh, they have, there's some affluence in the community and so I, and I, having been in the private sector for many years prior to politics, and most recently in these last four years, I know what it's like to make payroll. I know what it's like to to live um, in, in regards to supporting the family. And Mr. Pelyev speaks as though he has some context of the issue, but he's always been a politician. He's always lived life through the gatekeepers that he keeps complaining about. What I'm saying and what I've noted is that people want to ensure that the economy grows, that we have sustainable programs that support uh, the sustainable economy that support those programs. And they want someone that's to be able to legitimately provide solutions. He hasn't offered any solutions whatsoever. 
And I think people come to recognize that these policies are reckless and we need something more serious and some policies that are more directed to growing the economy, protecting the environment and protecting those programs that people care about. Uh, well, you, you say that, and of course, the big program people are talking about right now is health care. And while that is a, a provincial responsibility, Ottawa does have a role in it. Uh, uh, there is right now, right across the country, a lack of primary doctors, overwhelmed hospitals, of course, also in Ontario. And if the pandemic showed us anything, it's the fact that the system operates on thin margins. So I'm wondering, you being a former finance minister, how should Ottawa, and by that the government you're now about to join, how should Ottawa be responding to the healthcare crisis right now? You know, I myself, as a volunteer, I started a foundation to build a long-term care home and affordable housing complex, 350 units. So I understand specifically and very well the challenges faced by some of these institutions to provide home care, as seniors care, and acute care. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that we need talent, we need personnel, we need docs and nurses and PSWs, we need to attract them. So we need to make sure that the funds that are transferred to the provinces are being utilized effectively for uh, the front line to ensure that we transform the way we provide services so that people can get what they need. And that includes surgeries and, and elective surgeries. But one of the things I, I find confusing is the notion of accountability. And certainly when I was in the province, I was sort, I was trying to provide greater transfers from the federal government to support these needs. And I was prepared to take accountability measures to enact them. Because over the last two, three years during the pandemic, a lot of money was funded to the provinces and they weren't utilized appropriately. And I think the federal government, and for that matter, the, the, the constituents, the people that are, are voting, the taxpayer, they wanna make certain that the levels of governments stand united, work towards the ultimate goal, which is to provide the services. And for that, they want accountability. They want accountability, but you know, we, people are at the same time just wondering who's going to, to break this this impasse, this log jam. What should Ottawa be doing to that favor, like to, to that purpose rather? We, we've heard them mention accountability from the provinces. We're still at this standstill. How do you break that log jam? Well, listen, I, 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 I mean, I was just elected last night but I do have a sense of what I would prefer to see as a constituent, as an individual, uh, you know, as a person who has a family of three kids and, and seniors at home. I mean, we want to make certain that whatever taxpayer dollars are utilized and are paid, we want to make sure we get value for them. We don't care if it's municipal, provincial or federal. All we care about is making certain that those tax dollars are employed properly. What we're dealing here is jurisdictional issues. And we got to make certain that the provinces and the federal government stay strong in ultimately providing the services that are necessary. And that requires the provinces to ensure that those funds are used appropriately. I was prepared to take accountability measures when I was asking for more transfer funds from the, from the federal government at the time. Okay, and that brings up my last question to you. Uh, even though I'm running out of time, I want to ask it. You did sit in cabinet uh, provincially for Ontario. Are you expecting a cabinet portfolio now that you're coming to Ottawa? I'm just excited and pleased that I've been elected and and uh, and to be a voice for the community of Mississauga Lakeshore. I mean, these folks. You'd like to be a cabinet minister. I I am not going to speculate other than serve my serve my constituents well, and that's that was the goal and. I'm, I'm very pleased to have that opportunity. Okay, well, Mr. Sousa, uh, thank you very much for the time. We're watching. Best of luck to you. All the best. Thank you. Clearer communication and more efficient delivery. That is what Canada's taxpayers' ombudsperson is calling for. Francois Boileau releasing his second annual report today, tracking complaints about the Canada Revenue Agency and recommending a path forward for the CRA. Monsieur Boileau, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Now, you say that your office received a higher than usual volume of complaints between April 2021 to the end of March 2022. Uh, why is that? Do you understand, uh, or rather, do you have an understanding as to why the number of complaints went up? Yes, we do. It's a, it's a pandemic. Uh, we were dealing with the, not only the aftermath, because we were still in it, in it. And, and so all the emergency programs that, uh, that the government of Canada, uh, implemented, well, that came, that came with, uh, with a price, uh, and, and, um, 
and so we received many complaints. It's uh, interesting because we had the uh, um, Auditor General uh, looking at it from one uh, point of view last week, and I'm looking at it from another point of view. So she looked at it as value for money, but I'm looking at it as uh, as a customer point of view. So those who were uh, trying to receive those uh, those uh, benefits, but uh, weren't uh, always successful, nor uh, that communication toward them was on time. So 40% of our complaints this year was about uh, pandemic issues. So the majority or the plurality about pandemic issues, as you say. Now, was that because clients did not understand the system or was it because the CRA was not uh, moving quickly enough or at least as quickly as they wanted them to? That's correct. It's a second option. And also because uh, the, the, the communication wasn't clear. So I'm not suggesting that uh, to uh, to the, the public that the CRA did a poor job in trying to get the money out to people. I'm suggesting that their communication wasn't clear enough. So if you say on a website that it's four weeks, uh, and, and so Canadians expect that it's four weeks to wait until you receive you know, those benefits, or at least a confirmation. But if uh, it becomes those four weeks, eight weeks, 10, 12 weeks, as we have received as complaints, um, then you ask questions. And that's what we did during the course of the year. So they changed the CR, it changed at one point to say, okay, now it's it's not only four weeks, it's going to be eight weeks of, uh, of waiting for the application process. But uh, many people, uh, it wasn't clear for the citizen that when does those eight weeks begin? And for the CRA's point of view, it was uh, when it is assigned to an officer. Well, that's not exactly what it says on the website. Um, the citizen doesn't care. You know, it, it sends the application, so the clock starts ticking at that point. Um, so we had to deal with, a, with this a situation with the CRA. No one is in bad faith here. Uh, no one is going to bed uh, during the evening saying, things, hmm, how can we do something to, the, to Canadians uh, the day after? So it's not that at all. They were submerged with, uh, with uh, uh, applications. Uh, they were, uh, it's new. Uh, even in June 2021, it was still relatively new for them to, to pass, uh, to go from a culture of, of uh, reco- um, uh <clears throat> So as to go from a culture that uh, you're you're trying to recover mm-hmm. uh, money to mm-hmm. a culture of giving money out, so that's something different. But they've done the best they can, but they could have been more thorough in terms of communication. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's interesting because you also raised the issue of communication in terms of the impact that receiving benefits would actually have on one's income. Talk to us about that because there seemed to be okay. a, a, a lot of confusion around that as well. Well, we were uh, in the midst of, of uh, preparing uh, a, a case for, for the CRA in regards to the um, uh, GIC, so mm-hmm. the uh, Supplement Income for Seniors. Uh, so that's, that's very important uh, for people that receive the GIC. And uh, so if they applied for a, a CERB, for instance, they saw their revenue going higher, you know, uh, to – and, and – and, because of that, they saw their revenue go higher, and therefore the um, a reduction or an elimination of the GIC. And that came as a shock for many seniors who didn't expect that. They rely on the GIC to pay the rent, to pay their bills, to put money on uh, uh, food on the table. So it was a huge issue, and, and we brought it up. But Parliament uh, was seized with this uh, question, and and they they've settled this. The government uh, allowed for seven hundred and forty two million, if I remember correctly, to solve this uh, this uh, to settle this issue. So the GIC that was done. So we spoke about this in our annual report, but we didn't came uh, we didn't went as thorough with this because it was already settled by by Parliament. But mm-hmm. the reflection is that it could have happened again. For instance, a new dental plan uh, for for a low income uh, citizen, mm-hmm. but the, it's the most vulnerable citizen of all that uh, will be able to apply for the new dental plan. Will they see will they see a, a increase in their revenue and therefore losing other benefits that they would have? Uh, so I got the insurance that no, it's not going to happen for them. But we we just don't know. So just to make sure that if we do have new programs or new benefits uh, in place to think about the communication to 
the client, to say to, to the client, well, be aware that it may increase your revenue. And in terms of provincial programs, they, they as well depend uh, often on the revenue that you're making. So the declaration that you're making on the T1. So therefore, it's it's already it's very important to make sure that if that people would be aware that if they apply for uh, a program such as CERB uh, again they, or another program from the federal government, that their revenue could increase and therefore be penalized with other programs that they receive uh, with the provincial or federal. Well, I'm losing time, but you do raise an interesting point here, and I wonder if you could talk about this quickly, because it seems in terms of broad strokes, then, what you're looking for is greater communication from CRA to Canadians so that they understand uh, the times as well as the benefits they're entitled to, but also it seems a, a better tracking system so that Canadians can actually know where their requests are going through. Absolutely, that's exactly it. So to be transparent with, uh, with the clientele, so to, that someone would know, if they applied for something uh, that you know that may be late, that's fine. Canadians can expect uh, that you know there could be uh, issues with you know there, there was so many uh, demands on the CRE, and that's understandable. P- people would understand that. What they don't understand is the fact that they're being left a little bit not in the dark. I wouldn't go that far, but it uh, that the situation is not clear for them when they can expect to receive an answer. And that's crucially important for Canadians. And also to to have access to to enter our uh, our you know we're going to be in 2023 very very soon. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important for Canadians uh, to to receive the, um, the, the you know for instance a validation code code on the same day that you're uh, trying to get something with the CRE, not to wait for the postal. Uh, office to, to receive by the post office your uh, your your code so that you can have access to my account. I think these are things that we can settle uh, quickly. Other banks, major banks, do it. For instance, uh, they have validation the same day as well. So I'm I'm not confusing two issues. So there's a security code and also the validation yes. uh, of your identity. That can be done uh, as well. So take the tools that you need, put it out there on the for the benefit of the clients. Well, those are your recommendations. We'll be watching to see the response uh, from Parliament Hill. Mr. Wailo, thank you very much for the time today. My pleasure. Thank you. And that is our program for tonight. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow.